Welcome back to the Hardware Unbox News Corner. Today's episode is basically going to be about NVIDIA's GeForce RTX graphics cards because since we published our initial thoughts on the RTX series earlier this week, there's been a few additional tidbits and revelations to discuss. So without further ado, let's get the ray trace ball rolling and talk about some news. The thing you guys are probably most interested in is the performance of NVIDIA's GeForce RTX cards and how they stack up against previous gen Pascal offerings. As you are probably aware, NVIDIA spent most of their launch event talking about ray tracing and other RTX functionality, rather than discussing the actual performance of these cards in typical games. I think this frustrated a lot of people that just wanted to know how much faster an RTX 2080 Ti, for example, was outside of niche use cases like ray tracing. Well, we still don't have any independent benchmarks to share, and it will be at least a few weeks before we can, but NVIDIA did post an article to their blog that at least showed some charts comparing the RTX 2080 to GTX 1080 in a selection of games. Here's the chart in question, and for just one image, there's actually quite a lot to break down here. Firstly, all these games were benchmarked at 4K, but you can see six titles where NVIDIA has chosen to include results with DLSS, or Deep Learning Super Sample sampling enabled. DLSS uses the tensor cores to accelerate a neural network that post-processes images to smooth jagged edges and do all that usual anti-aliasing stuff at a much lower performance cost than regular anti-aliasing. The crucial thing to note about DLSS is it doesn't run the game at the native resolution. So in this chart, the DLSS results are not really being run at 4K like the rest of the results. Instead, the game is effectively rendered at a lower resolution and then upscaled with AI taking care of upscaling artifacts. We'll have to wait and see how DLSS impacts visual quality, but like with other sub-native rendering techniques, including checkerboard rendering, temporal rendering, and so forth, there is usually some negative impact to visual quality that helps give you that uplift in performance. So comparing the 1080 to the 2080 with DLSS enabled isn't a great apples to apples comparison. You'll also notice that NVIDIA claims the RTX 2080 provides two times the performance of the 1080, but that's only possible in these DLSS games. And even then, two of the six DLSS titles didn't actually reach 2x performance. So that 2x number isn't an accurate reflection of the performance difference between the two cards in typical games with identical quality settings. When looking at the non-DLSS results, you can see the 2080 provides a performance improvement anywhere from roughly 1.6x down to 1.3x. However, there's a few other things to note. Four of these games were tested with HDR enabled, likely with G-Sync HDR enabled on one of the new 4K 144Hz monitors. It wasn't that long ago that we tested the performance impact of HDR and G-Sync HDR and discovered that, at least with Pascal cards, enabling HDR can reduce performance by as much as 15% in titles like Shadow of War, which Nvidia is showing here with some of the largest performance gains. If Turing has architectural fixes that cope better with HDR and G-Sync HDR processing, enabling HDR on the RTX 2080 might not come with a performance hit. This means that testing with HDR enabled in these games would inflate the margin between the 2080 and 1080, a margin that wouldn't be as high when playing the game in the SDR mode, which 99.99% of gamers use. I'm not saying for sure that Turing has changes that result in no performance impact when enabling HDR, but the fact Nvidia here has specifically chosen to test some of these games with HDR enabled throws up a red flag for me. It's not going to be a common setting or common use case for these cards, and companies always want to portray their products in the best light. So it wouldn't be surprising if enabling HDR in these titles skewed things in favor of the RTX 2080. And then of course, there's the usual disclaimers about performance numbers provided directly from the company. Nvidia has almost certainly cherry picked the selection of games to make the RTX 2080 seem as good as possible. We don't know what settings we use to benchmark these games either. And that means further cherry picking might've occurred with the game settings. And then there's this other slide that shows just 10 games with random FPS numbers below, apparently illustrating the RTX 2080 can play these titles at 4K HDR at above 60 FPS. To be honest, this image is completely useless because there is no comparison data and we have no idea what settings we used. You can quite easily tune these titles to run at above 60 FPS at 4K on something like the GTX 1080, so yeah, not all that useful. Even if Nvidia's performance numbers here are a general reflection of how the RTX 2080 performs, it still isn't looking all that good for these new Turing cards. The cheapest RTX 2080s you can pre-order right now 
are around $750 US dollars compared to just $450 for new GTX 1080s, which is a 67% increase in price. Yet Nvidia's own chart shows most games providing around a 40% performance uplift. So again, it's looking like the RTX cards might not be the best value. We strongly suggest you don't pre-order and don't purchase one of these GPUs until full performance reviews are available. The other big story from this week concerns the performance of ray tracing in RTX enabled games, particularly Shadow of the Tomb Raider and Battlefield 5, both of which were demoed on the show floor at Gamescom. Numerous publications who played these games reported performance that wasn't all that impressive. Shadow of the Tomb Raider running at just 1080p on an RTX 2080 Ti with ray tracing enabled didn't hit a consistent 60 FPS, often hovering around 40 to 50 FPS with clear dips into the 30s. And we're talking about the fastest Turing GPU here for consumers running the game at just a 1080p resolution. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider in particular, I actually watched IGN's, I think it was an extended capture of the game with ray tracing enabled. And to be honest, the lighting didn't look significantly improved compared to traditional non-ray trace lighting. At least the improvement wasn't really enough to justify running at sub 60 FPS at 1080p on a graphics card that costs more than $1,000. I'll of course have to play the game for myself and see how ray tracing looks, but the general impression from people at the event and from you guys out there that have watched the footage is that it looked pretty underwhelming. I should note here, of course, that the version of the game being demoed was a pre-release version. The drivers were pre-launch and there's still plenty of scope for optimization, but I'm not sure optimization will be able to improve things all that much when the setting appears so taxing from the start. The other game showed was Battlefield 5, and again, reports suggested the game was running at sub 60 FPS at 1080p with ray tracing enabled on an RTX 2080 Ti, which is even more dire for a fast paced game like a first person multiplayer shooter. Ray tracing does look very impressive in Battlefield, but again, most gamers won't want to run at below 60 FPS on a flagship card just to get some nice looking reflections and shadows. This sort of performance when enabling ray tracing isn't super surprising considering how computationally taxed ray tracing is, but when it's the killer new feature of Nvidia's upcoming graphics cards and it's one of the reasons why they're so expensive, it's cause for concern to say the least. It's probably worth talking about the full list of games confirmed to support RTX functionality and Nantech here has a nicely organized list that shows whether the game supports real-time ray tracing, DLSS or both. Uh, the key games to show here are as follows. We've got Battlefield 5 and Metro Exodus both support ray tracing but not DLSS. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is shown to support only ray tracing as well, but interestingly, in video's own performance slides from earlier, uh, the game is shown to support DLSS, so not sure what's up with that. Uh, PUBG, Hitman 2, and Final Fantasy 15 support just DLSS, so no ray tracing there. And there's a couple of others. The new version of Assetto Corsa, a very popular racing game, will support ray tracing, as will Control, the upcoming title from Remedy Entertainment, the makers of Quantum Break and Alan Wake. Neither of those games support DLSS. A couple of other quick things to round out this video. The GeForce RTX 2070 does not have an NVLink connector as confirmed by photos of the RTX 2070 and also Nvidia's page showing the supported graphics cards for the NVLink bridge. Essentially, just the RTX 2080 and RTX 2080 Ti will have the connector. NVLink replaces the SLI connector, offering a much higher bandwidth interconnect between multiple GPUs. SLI connectors were removed from the GTX 1060 in the previous version, restricting the functionality to just the 1070 and above. And now with the RTX 20 series, the connector is gone from the 2070, so that limits SLI to just the upper end cards. Generally, we don't recommend anyone use SLI anyway due to its poor scale and lack of support in a lot of games, but it's interesting Nvidia is removing the option from more cards. Last topic for this Nvidia Special Edition News Corner, Nvidia has announced Ansel RTX, an upgraded version of Ansel that makes use of the RTX capabilities of Turing GPUs. For the few people that use Ansel, there are some cool features in here like Ansel ray tracing, which injects way more rays than would be suitable for real-time rendering to deliver a much higher quality static image. There's also Ansel AI up res, which allows you to save Ansel screenshots in up to 8K through the power of tensor cores and AI. There's also a few new filters and a wider range of supported games. That's it for this week's news corner. As always, it's worth subscribing to catch this segment in your inbox every Friday. And don't forget to hit the bell icon because 
you know how his YouTube doesn't work all that well sometimes. Check out Steve's video as well on our first impressions of the GeForce RTX series if you missed it. Consider supporting us on Patreon. We just did our live stream the other day and it was a blast. We reviewed a whole bunch of GeForce rumors that didn't end up being true. So you can check out the replay of that as well if you are a Patreon member. And I'll see you next time.